It was nice. My partner actually works here, so I got the chance to pop in her office, meet her colleagues. That was nice. Um, so today I want to talk to you about what I consider to be a kind of a neglected area of contemporary psychedelics research, which is what, uh, and this is a term you probably maybe haven't even seen, what we typically call instrumental psychedelics research. So the basic idea of instrumental psychedelics research um, in this context or in any context is that we're not studying psychedelics for its own sake, but we're using it as a vehicle to study other phenomena. Okay. So with the kind of the renaissance that's been going on psychedelics, I think a lot of the attention has been focused on kind of neuroimaging research, research to try to understand kind of neurophysiological characteristics of psychedelic responses. And then also on the other hand, the therapeutics, of course, which obviously has you know important you know potential uh, clinical implications. Whereas I think this this kind of domain within here has tended to get kind of neglected. Um, so coming from a background of experimental psychology and cognitive neuroscience, that's actually what's kind of most interesting to me and most appealing to me. Um, so I should just say um, the talk is going to be a little bit disorganized, um, and I think that's appropriate for a psychedelic talk, of course. You know? Um, so I'm going to be talking about four different areas that are kind of only um, somewhat interlinked, um, just because I thought I would, it would be more interesting rather than focusing on one, just to give you a taste of some of the different things that we're working on. Um, but hopefully they'll kind of come together to, to some extent. Um, before we begin, I, it's always, it's very easy to forget um, to acknowledge people. So I just want to acknowledge all these different people from many different universities. You can see these are all different collaborators on different projects. Um, it's possible I probably even left out a few people. So really, this is very much collaborative work. Um, and some of the work I'm presenting, you know, I played a role in it, but it was relatively small compared with other people. Um, so, and I'll be flagging some of those people as we go along. And then just as an aside, I just thought I would flag uh, Simon uh, Ruffle. Um, so he just published, or he just uh, posted a preprint today um, reviewing the um, ayahuasca. Um, I'm not going to be talking about ayahuasca today, but he's my former PhD student. He's now a postdoc in Melbourne uh, doing really uh, cool work on um, um, ayahuasca within the clinical trials at the University of Melbourne. Um, so if anyone's interested in ayahuasca, um, we just uh, posted this paper this morning, actually. So take a look at that if you are interested in ayahuasca. So as I said, we're jumping around a little bit, but I'm going to talk about kind of four different um, areas. So the first, um, I'm going to talk about the phenomenon of synesthesia and how we and other people have used psychedelics as a vehicle to study this kind of um, really unique um, aspect of perception. I'm going to then shift focus um, to talk about another core um, element of perception, which is time perception, um, and some of the work that we've done in psychedelics uh, to study different features of time perception. Um, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the theme of instrumentalism, where I'm going to talk about some recent research we've done, which actually allows us to use cognitive tasks to target and investigate some of the predicted mechanisms underlying how psychedelics actually work. So there's some particularly exciting elements there that you can do purely just with perceptual tasks where you don't actually need neuroimaging or anything like that. Next, um, I'm going to shift focus very <laughs> quite a bit to uh, talk about a really a neglected uh, drug that meets most of the characteristics of a psychedelic substance, which is nitrous oxide. Um, so this has really kind of been neglected, and there's a lot of attention to it because of its recreational use. But I want to make the case that uh, nitrous oxide is an incredibly valuable tool for research. Um, there's also some interesting clinical efficacy um, that aligns it with contemporary work on psychedelics as well. And then finally, um, I think it's really, really important to counteract the hype surrounding psychedelics. I know this is a psychedelic society, so we'll, I hope I'm not going <laughs> to, I hope we won't uh, um, come to uh, intense arguments here. But I do want to flag some really salient methodological challenges that are confronting this field, um, particularly about that are that I think have tended to be neglected as psychedelics that are continue to be hyped and um, promoted at a really, um, really uh, widespread manner. So we we'll spend some time on that. Um, I think probably a number of you are going to disagree with on some of the points I'm going to make, but I'm hoping we can have some friendly discussion about that. So first, talk about synesthesia. So synesthesia is a really fascinating developmental condition in which some type of stimulus in your environment will trigger an anomalous concurrent experience. So the, the stimulus that produces the response is called an inducer, 
uh, whereas the, the, you know, the perceptual or image that you might experience is, is referred to as the concurrent experience. So the kind of the canonical example is grapheme color synesthesia, in which graphemes, so numbers and letters, will be paired with colors, right? So these are some com common uh, patterns that you see within synesthetes. So A will often be associated with the color red, B with the color blue, and so on and so forth. Um, now, the two kind of core features in terms of how you can, how synesthesia is typically kind of um, distinguished and identified are that it's reliable and that it's automatic. So reliable in the sense that synesthetes will have very consistent, reliable associations. So if you ask somebody one month later, six months later, a year later, they'll have the same, roughly speaking, associations. So it's something that's very, very reliable. It also appears to be largely automatic, such that when an individual experiences synesthesia, it's often something they can't suppress or inhibit, or it's very, very difficult to do so. So a nice example of this, this is a, uh, this is a bit of an unusual form of synesthesia, but this is a case study that we did a, a long time ago, where this is a, a woman who had face color synesthesia. So whenever she looks at faces, she experiences anomalous color experiences. This is considered the neurophysiological explanation for why some people report having auras, right? And um, face processing regions in the brain, like the fusiform face area, are actually adjacent to color processing regions. So it's not actually that strange of a phenomenon if you think about how the brain works. Basically, the brain regions are adjacent or right next to one another, right? So basically, what we can do is we can create congruent and incongruent pairings for this person. So when she looks at this face, she typically experiences the color pink. So if we pair that color, that face with the color pink, it's fairly easy uh, for her to process it. Whereas if we pair it with the color blue, it becomes much more difficult. Because when she sees that face, she experiences pink, but then she sees the blue on the screen, and that creates response conflict. So in this task, we asked her to judge uh, what was the color on the screen while actually ignoring the face. Right? So she effectively had to kind of try to suppress or inhibit her synesthetic experience. So here we have the congruent and congruent faces. These are just response times in this task. And what you find is that people without synesthesia do not differ in their response times to judge the color of these two, All right? which makes sense, right? Because most of us don't have face color associations. Right? When we bring her into the lab, she has very, very strong what are called congruency effects. So she's much slower for the incongruent faces than the congruent faces, right? And you can, um, you can uh, identify kind of EEG correlates of this effect, this response conflict effect. The reason why I want to use this as an example is that just to kind of illustrate the reliability of synesthesia as well as the automaticity of synesthesia, which are widely seen as the kind of the two core characteristics of this phenomenon. So just a little bit more about this. Um, so synesthesia in the developmental context is relatively rare. So we're talking about one to four percent of the population. So you know we might expect maybe um, one or two synesthetes here today. Um, it is hereditary, but it sh seems to be shaped by early one's early environment. So a classic uh, study that's been widely replicated is that often synesthesia synesthetes their associations between graphemes and colors are shaped by um, exposure to refrigerator magnets as a child. It's really important because some people kind of misunderstand this. Refrigerator magnets don't cause synesthesia, okay? Many of us have refrigerator magnets and we don't have synesthesia. Rather, if you had the kind of the genetic predisposition towards synesthesia and you had refrigerator magnets, that might shape your specific associations, okay? Now, within the context of, of today's talk, what we're interested in is anecdotal reports of drug-induced synesthesia. So this is something that's widely, widely reported. Um, you'll see this on all the kind of different psychedelic scales. Um, it comes up in all sorts of papers on psychedelics that people will have spontaneous episodes of synesthesia when they uh, consume various types of psychedelics. Now, we were initially became interested in this question because um, it's, it's interesting in and of itself, what are these kind of synesthetic experiences that these individuals are having when they take various types of drugs, but actually has really profound theoretical implications for how we think about the brain mechanisms underlying synesthesia. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. The main thing I want to flag is that um, around the time that we were doing this research, one of the dominant models um, is this cross-activation theory, where the basic idea is you have graphene processing region which is, again, adjacent to a color processing region. 
And the basic idea was that people with synesthesia just have extra structural connections between these regions, right? And that might be something that they were born with, there might be some type of genetic predisposition for that, or whatever the case might be. But the basic idea was you have extra structural connections between these regions. Other types of theoretical models kind of oppose that and emphasize the role of kind of more parietal regions to, to bind together the grapheme and colors. Now, what's interesting is if drugs are producing synesthesia and producing you know, reliable automatic episodes of synesthesia that would meet our characteristics for developmental synesthesia, this would go against this theory because psychedelic drugs are not gonna be able to produce extreme structural changes in the brain in the, in the matter of minutes. That's just not going to happen. Right. So if psychedelics are producing synesthetic experiences, this kind of poses important theoretical challenges for these types of models. It would align more with other types of models involving, for example, parietal cortex. So this was kind of our, our background motivation. So the first thing we did was we surveyed the literature. We went through everything. What we did find was that drug-induced synesthesia seemed to be relatively common with serotonin agonists. So classic psychedelics that um, primarily target the serotonin system, so LSD, psilocybin, and so on. Um, but the types did not really align with the developmental literature. Okay? So these are all the different types of drug-induced synesthesia that we identified from a wide range of different reports. So here you have the inducer, here you have the concurrent. And the, one, the most common one was actually sound visual forms of synesthesia. These are relatively common on different types of psychedelic drugs. Whereas graphene color synesthesia, one of the most common forms of developmental synesthesia, was very rare. We found actually only one case of it. So there's a real kind of discrepancy between the drug-induced synesthesia and these more developmental variants. Aside from that, we also noticed there's just a ton of problems with this literature. Um, and one of, the big focus, one of the big problems was that there was a narrow focus on serotonin drugs. So we don't actually know for certain are people reporting synesthesia with ketamine, for example, or other, or other drugs that are not really targeting ser the ter serotonin system in the way that classic psychedelics do? So next what we did was we just did a survey of drug users, and I'm going to come to more experimental work in a moment. So we surveyed <laughs> drug users about their drug-induced synesthesia. Um, this is just a simple histogram here where you have 28 different drugs, and you have the incidence of the synesthesia in controls, so people who do not normally have synesthesia, and synesthetes, so people report, report being developmental synesthetes, right? And so what you'll see is that in some drugs, it's as high as 60% of individuals taking, for example, LSD will report having synesthesia during the experience. So it actually seems to be fairly common with some drugs. Other drugs, obviously, if this goes down radically. I don't know how many of you have had synesthesia with caffeine, for example, right? <laughs> Um, so it's a very, very low prevalence of that. I certainly have never had that. Um, and, but one thing you also notice about this plot, which I'm going to come to in the next slide, is that, the, is that the, the different colors are kind of clustering. So in blue, we have the tryptamines. These are LSD, ayahuasca, psilocybin. Then you have uh, phenethylamines, like mescaline, 2CI, and ecstasy in this light blue color. And you have the dissociatives, like DXM, ketamine, and so on. And so those are in red, nitrous oxide there. Um, so there seems to be some kind of clustering, all right? And, and so to keep that in mind, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment, right? The next thing I want to kind of highlight is we also looked at which drugs seem to modulate uh, the actual synesthesia in developmental synesthetes, right? And what we find is that tends to be very, very highly correlated with the incidence rates. So the basic take-home message is that the drugs that produce synesthesia in people who don't normally have synesthesia also enhance synesthesia in people who normally have it, right? So that actually kind of indirectly implies there's some type of overlapping mechanism in terms of how it's modulating developmental synesthesia versus how it's inducing it in non-synesthetes. So the next thing we did uh, is we wanted to probe this clustering. So we're, we're very nervous when we first started looking at this that some of these effects might just be kind of random and, and there's not really any meaning to the order of these incidence rates, right? Uh, but then when we saw the clustering, we were kind of intrigued by that, so we wanted to kind of probe that further. So we came up with a statistical way using permutation analysis, and if anyone's interested, I can, I can tell you more about this later. 
of basically examining, is this clustering random or not? And what we found is that it's not random for, the, for all these different drugs, all these different drug classes. So basically the incidence rates are kind of hinting at something that's similar across different drugs within a specific class, right? That the, um, that the tryptamines in, dark, in uh, blue, they're, they're really associated with the kind of highest levels of inducing synesthesia. It's a much more common experience in those types of drugs than it is, for example, in dissociatives. So based on this work, we're, you know, we're sufficiently intrigued to kind of see if we could um, investigate this in the lab. So we did our first lab study of drug-induced synesthesia um, back in, I think it was 2014. So we piggybacked on um, the, the new trial that was going on in Imperial, um, which some of you are probably well aware of. And so this was done in collaboration with the Imperial group. And so this was a, just a simple design where Parkinson's got placebo or LSD on different days. And we gave them a very simple task to examine whether graphemes, so numbers and different types of sounds, would produce color experiences under the influence of LSD relative to uh, placebo. And we were able to target three different um, measures which are common features of developmental synesthesia. So first, are they actually just subjectively reporting more colors in response to sounds and numbers? Two, are they actually consistent? And that's a critical feature, again, of developmental synesthesia. And is there some degree of specificity? So in synesthesia, some, stim some stimuli will produce synesthesia, but other stimuli will not. So there's a good degree of specificity within developmental synesthesia. We want to see if we can reproduce that. So for example, if the number six produces the color uh, blue, for example, we would expect that to be consistent at multiple time points, and that six would kind of reliably produce a color experience as well. So um, this was a small study. This is one of the first kind of uh, LSD studies in the modern era in the UK um, that we were able to kind of um, participate in. So it's important to emphasize we only had 10 participants in the study, which is really, really poor when you think about statistical power and trying to identify effects. The take home message though, was that we didn't really observe any kind of profound effects, all right? What we did find is that this is the color experiences. So we, do found, we did find that in response to both sounds and graphemes, um, LSD uh, was associated with more color experience than placebo. These are relatively weak effects. So it's not some huge pronounced effect though, okay? Next, in terms of consistency, a higher score here actually means less consistent. So they were actually less consistent in their graphene color associations and their sound color associations. So this really goes against what we see in developmental synesthesia. And then finally, in terms of the specificity, uh, lower values indicate greater specificity. So we did see a tiny bit of evidence for that, but it was nowhere near statistical significance. So in other words, basically the same kind of stimuli tended to be more likely to produce um, synesthetic experiences but um, it wasn't a very robust effect. So basically the take-home message was that um, uh, LSD in the lab does produce some kind of anomalous color experiences, and we did find that they report other types of synesthesia as well, but it doesn't meet the criteria for consistency and specificity that you see in developmental variants of synesthesia. So this kind of led us to come up with a a hypothesis regarding, um, which is relatively simple idea, and it will, it will make a great deal of sense to you uh, when you first hear it. So we kind of realized that if you're producing synesthesia uh, when somebody consumes LSD or psilocybin, it's not going to be consistent because the consistent associations have to be learned, right? So it's a, they're a product of your environment. Think about those refrigerator magnets you were exposed to. So synesthete is not going to be consistent at first, at the first step. Rather, it's something that is learned, and then they become consistent over time. And this is actually what you see in children with synesthesia. So children with synesthesia have very disorganized associations at first, but over time they become consolidated and consistent. So what we were then hoping to find was the best way we could investigate this question within the context of drug-induced synesthesia is to find somebody who has acquired synesthesia through drug use, right? There are anecdotal reports of this, of people having basically permanent synesthesia after an excessive dose of psychedelics, but we were kind of then on the hunt for basically finding one of these people. And luckily we did. 
So um, a few years ago, we identified, uh, we, just we just identified him by his initials. Uh, so LW is a 29-year-old male who has had synesthesia for seven years since the age of 22, which, does, which is something you don't observe in developmental synesthesia. You, you, you observe it at a very, very early age, for example. So this happened from what he claims, we have to be careful because it's based on his self-report, of course, uh, that this was driven by a single dose of 2CB, which is a serotonin agonist. Um, and he took basically what we estimate as anywhere from about three to 12 times the normal dosage, all right, um, at some type of uh, party, basically. So needless to say, it was an, a really an excessive uh, dose. And then the next day he woke up and he had synesthesia and he's had it ever since for the last seven years. Uh, um, his most prominent form was face color synesthesia, which you've already been introduced. Um, I used an image like this to kind of um, to point it out to him and he said that this is kind of what his synesthesia is like, that there's some type of like a, um, different colored auras around individuals. Some of you have maybe heard of hallucinogen persisting perception disorder. Uh, which is a kind of a, a parallel condition where people have long-term uh, perceptual effects in response to psychedelics. Now, what was very exciting was we gave him a classic standardized consistency test, where and we gave this to him, I think it was a few weeks apart, and he met the criteria for consistency. So his associations were actually consistent, which is what you see in developmental synesthesia. And what was also very interesting for us is that he, initially, he reported that his associations were originally unstable and they were highly chaotic, but they became consistent over time, which is kind of what we'd expect with this consolidation idea that I've talked about a moment ago. So then what we wanted to do was we wanted to see if we all could also see this automaticity, right? That when he has the color experiences, it's automatic in the way you see with de developmental synesthesia. So we did a face color priming task in which we would present him with faces and then a color and he would have to identify the color. Now, for um, individuals without synesthesia, this is super easy, um, and you respond very, very quickly. Um, it's very easy to identify the color. For an individual face color synesthesia, this is really challenging because the face elicits anomalous color experiences, and that interferes with the perception of green on the screen. Okay. So here we have congruent, incongruent. So congruent, the light colors, incongruent, the dark colors for the controls. And what I want to highlight here is they're very clustered together in terms of their response times and in terms of their errors. And that's very much consistent with the fact that they don't really have any kind of congruency effects because they don't have face color associations. Now, this is one of the largest effects I've kind of ever observed with something like this, basically. So his error rate, when it was incongruent, is at like 95%. All right. Um, it, this, is, this is on the borderline of whether we could even analyze these data, I should say, right? Because we ended up with such a small, luckily we had an incredibly large number of trials. We had on the order of hundreds of trials. So we were able to look at this. And then the response times are also very, very different. Um, so he's much slower when it's incongruent than when it's congruent, but it's primarily an error rate effect. But also one thing I want to highlight, which is really striking, is he has a kind of a, in, when it's congruent, Okay, so basically when the face matches the color, his, what you'd expect is that it actually should make the task easier. It kind of gives him an advantage, right? Because when he sees his face, it's green, he kind of he kind of almost knows in advance that it'll be green, and in theory that should help him. And that's what you see, it's called, uh, um, these, these are called priming effects, of course. Um, and indeed, he was faster on the congruent, even though he had similar error rates. All right, so it actually, his synesthesia kind of almost seemed to kind of help them out in this task. But the critical take home was that basically this meets the criteria for synesthesia. So he's consistent, he's automatic, um, and he has a great deal of specificity. So the last thing that we tried was to target um, a, ne the, a neurophysiological marker of, of developmental synesthesia. So we had previously done some research a while back uh, using TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation, if you stimulate uh, the back of the head, so primary visual cortex here, um, in, in most individu individuals, this triggers what are known as phosphenes, which are basically kind of like flickers or kind of anomalous light experiences. And you can use this as a proxy measure of how excitable um, the visual cortex is. 
So in some previous research, what we found was that the main idea I want to highlight here is that synesthetes in blue have lower phosphine thresholds than controls in black. But importantly, they don't differ in other types of TMS thresholds, so motor thresholds, for example. And this effect has been replicated a few times over by us, but also by other groups. So we tried to do this in him, and uh, this was a perfectly negative result. So these are the phosphine thresholds. That's him right there. He's perfectly in the middle. Okay. So there's really, he does not exhibit this characteristic that seems to be a relatively reliable neurophysiological marker of developmental synesthesia. So this kind of might point to um, some type of fundamental difference in terms of the developmental window at which they start to experience the synesthesia. Um, this is kind of a, a tricky issue, um, but uh, nevertheless, it kind of does point to some important uh, differences. So briefly, uh, before I move on, drug-induced synesthesia seems to be more common in drugs targeting the serotonin system, so classic psychedelics, for example. Um, I've taken you through some evidence for transient and acquired synesthesia. Um, we think now the synesthesia criteria are kind of problematic in a way because they're actually driven by overlearning. And there's actually now a research showing you can train synesthesia. Um, and the question becomes is, it, you know, to what extent is that synesthesia or not? So there are some kind of um, tricky issues here. If we do accept this as some type of form of synesthesia, which, uh, which we think it, it clearly is, then this really, this really challenges this kind of classic structural idea. Although one thing that's possible is that this might be a product of overlearning, and then he actually developed these structural connections over time, but it certainly wasn't there when he first developed his synesthesia. So I hope that kind of gives you a nice illustration of how you can use psychedelics to start probing some questions within uh, consciousness research, in particular about a phenomenon like synesthesia. So now I'm going to shift focus to um, another um, perceptual effect that we're really interested in, which is time perception. So um, probably you're all well aware, in addition to something like synesthesia, distortions in time perception are a fundamental feature of various types of altered states of consciousness. You see this in a wide range of contexts where uh, different features of awareness and perception are distorted. So you see this in like meditation and hypnosis and psychedelics and a whole host of other contexts. Now what we know is that LSD produces subjective changes in time perception, as do other psychedelics. Um, and there is some evidence, it's relatively weak and older. I'm citing papers from the 1950s here, which is not something we normally do. Um, but these are some of the only studies that have actually probed this. Um, but we were intrigued by a study on psilocybin, which actually was, um, was done in, um, I believe it was in Switzerland. And they did it in, in uh, 2007, kind of before this new trend to kind of emerge in psychedelics research. And they examined the impact of psilocybin on timing. And what was striking was that they, they observed that time perception tasks seem to be more sensitive to the impact of psychedelics. So, for example, they found that the psilocybin didn't really affect other cognitive functions like attention and working memory, but it did affect time perception. So we thought that basically time perception um, might be especially salient to what's going on in terms of the perceptual changes associated with psychedelics. So that was why we were interested in targeting that in our next study. So we had the unique opportunity to um, contribute to uh, one of the first micro randomized controlled um, microdosing studies that was done um, back in, I think it was about 2015 or 16. And our paper was published a few years after that. Um, this is in a study with 48 healthy older adults who were randomly allocated um, to one of four different doses. So one was placebo and then 5, 10, 20 micrograms of LSD. Um, so for those who are not familiar with microdosing, I'm sure you probably all are, but just to be on the safe side. Um, so basically microdosing is um, the use of very, very um, small doses that typically do not elicit psychoactive effects. Um, this is becoming a massive trend. You often hear about in Silicon Valley and other areas where they're microdosing to enhance their creativity, something like that. Potentially some of you are microdosing right now. Um, <laughs> There is some controversy about it, uh, particularly since um, in, in the therapeutic context, and we can certainly talk about that in a moment, 
But what we were intrigued by was we're able to have blind experimenters and we're able to examine subjective drug effects. But what's interesting about microdosing is that um, many participants are unaware of which condition they're in. They have a very difficult time guessing, which basically is something I'll return to when we talk about methodological challenges with psychedelics research more generally. So we have them complete a temporal reproduction task. And the basic idea is participants are exposed to a stimulus interval, like a blue circle on the screen uh, for a period of time. And then they have to press and hold down a button to reproduce that interval. So this is a classic time perception task. It's been widely used, extensively validated. We know quite a bit about the kind of the operations behind it, um, neurophysiological mechanisms, and so on and so forth. So briefly, uh, we kind of confirmed, for the most part, the, the idea that um, LS, microdose of LSD do not elicit really pronounced subjective drug effects. Okay. So these are five different self-report measures. LSD is in blue, placebo is in green. And this is um, in gray is when they completed our time perception task. And zero is, at, is dose. Um, so in, for drug effects, this is kind of basically, do you notice any type of drug effect? And what you find are some very weak but statistically significant effects. So when you hear people claim that people don't know when they're that they can't distinguish a microdose from a placebo, it's not necessarily always true, okay? So participants were able to kind of, um, to distinguish to, at some subjective level about whether they were experiencing any, any type of basic drug effects, right? What they're picking up on is obviously unclear. Perceptual distortions, these effects are not significant. Unusual thoughts, uh, not significant. Feeling high, a very, very weak effect there. Uh, differences in concentration, uh, nothing there. Um, these effects got much more messy when we distinguish different doses of LSD, uh, but you will see some types of kind of linear patterns there, but it doesn't always align with the actual dose, right? So the highest dose is here in dark blue, uh, but the middle dose is down here, for example. So there's kind of some messy effects there. But again, the take home message here would be that basically um, LSD um, at the microdose level is producing some subjective effects um, but these are not uh, anywhere near as robust as, or, or as extreme as you'd see with classic kind of uh, psychedelic doses. Okay, so this is a temporal reproduction task. On the y-axis are their reproduced durations. So them holding down the button in response to all these different intervals. So 800 milliseconds through to 4,000 milliseconds. And the results are fairly clear cut that basically in the LSD condition, you see that their values are higher here. So they're reproducing the intervals as though they're longer in the, in the LSD condition than the placebo condition. Now, at first glance, you might think, okay, they're over reproducing, but they're reporting them as longer than they actually are. And I'll kind of unpack this in a little bit, but you have to realize that this is 4,000 milliseconds, right? So they should be responding all the way up here, right? So you can imagine this kind of line right here. So basically, all the participants are under-reproducing the interval. They're all kind of estimating it as shorter than it actually is, okay? But what's interesting is in the LSD condition, that effect is reduced. So you're actually reducing this classic bias that you see in uh, time perception tasks. Again, this effect was a bit messier uh, when we looked at the different doses, but there are some kind of uh, clear-cut effects uh, particularly for the longer intervals. And critically, these are unrelated to subjective drug effects. So statistically, we can include the subjective drug effects and see if that accounts for these effects. Um, and we found really no evidence that it did. So at first glance, we were kind of, you know, we were, we were not exactly sure how to interpret this. It got picked up by the media because we acknowledged that, strictly speaking, they got better on the task because they are, strictly speaking, getting closer to the objective interval, which is right here. And so some people in the media did kind of jump to that. And, you know, it's a bit unfortunate how that works. But so we were kind of struggling with how we were thinking about this. And so we kind of sat on it. We published the paper and we thought about, about it a little bit more. And alongside this, we've been doing um, some work on, on Bayesian models of time perception. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's a little bit, um, a little bit complicated, a bit off topic. But 
The basic idea is that our perceptual states are driven by two factors. So one is the sensory evidence that we acquire from our environment, and the second are what in Bayesian terms are referred to as priors. So this might be your expectations, your beliefs, and so on and so forth. These are mixed together to produce your perceptual states. Okay? It's a fairly kind of simple um, uh, account of time perception. So the basic idea would be that how we perceive time is shaped by the objective interval that we're exposed to, like a, like a one-second interval, but also our priors based on our expectations and statistical regularities of the environment. So it might be like if the previous interval is really long, you tend to kind of shift your prior towards expecting it to be longer, and that biases your time perception. Now, this is um, widely accepted as kind of a very nice and elegant account of why you get this under-reproduction effect. So again, this is the objective interval, and what you typically find is that people tend to over-reproduce short intervals and under-reproduce long intervals, right? And the reason is that the prior is the mean interval, the mean st uh, stimulus duration that you kind of expect, and that biases your perception toward the average, effectively. So your perceptual states are biased towards the average and away from the actual sensory evidence. So around this time, uh, Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston, um, who obviously very in influential people in this field, you, many of you have probably heard of them, they advanced a um, model of psychedelics, what they called the Rebus model, which is relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. And the basic idea is that the simple kind of take home right, idea is that psychedelics reduce your reliance on priors, right? So basically, priors are, do not, are not able to shape perception in the way they normally do on the influence of psychedelics. There's some controversy about this, and I think there are some counter instances to this, okay? So I think there's actually clearly situations where our reliance on priors is actually enhanced under psychedelics. But we're intrigued with this model in this type of context because this kind of conceptually aligns with what we're thinking about here. So if we go back to this, if you were to relax priors, so priors um, in red no longer have an influence, what's going to happen is this blue line is going to shift closer to the objective interval. It's going to kind of move up here, and that's what we, what we observe here. So more recently, we've done, we've examined this uh, using a more kind of rigorous modeling approach. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good figure for this, but we did corroborate that idea. So basically, the take -home, what we found was that um, LSD reduces the impact of priors um, when performing this task. And, this, and what's nice is this aligns with this Rebus model. So it kind of provides an example of how we can use a relatively simple time perception task to uh, corroborate and test some of the predictions from this type of neurophysiological account of psychedelics. So shifting focus again. Um, I'm now going to kind of convince you all that um, if you are interested in psychedelics, you should shift focus and start studying nitrous oxide. Right. Um, you might not be able to convince you all of that, but I hope I convince some of you. So nitrous oxide um, was first discovered in the late 18th century. It was widely used um, as like a party drug um, in the area of London where I actually live, Vauxhall. <laughs> they used to do all sorts of kind of nitrous oxide parties there. Um, and, you know, in the 19th century, you start to see its use in medical contexts, um, and it continues to be fairly widely used in a wide range of different contexts. So it's, a it's formally classified as a dissociative anesthetic. So it's used in surgery, in dentistry, um, for re pain reduction, but also anesthesia. And importantly, it's listed in the kind of the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. So it's widely kind of regarded as a really important kind of medicinal value in a wide range of different contexts. Um, so you inhale nitrous oxide uh, like this, and I'll talk a little bit more about its kind of time signature in a moment, which I think is very important. Um, it has a very similar kind of neurochemistry. It's not the same. Um, it primarily targets uh, NMDA receptors. So these are glutamate receptors. Uh, it also has very similar phenomenological or subjective effects to ketamine, okay, which many of you probably are much more familiar with because there's so much more attention to ketamine in terms of clinical research as well as uh, neuroscience research. 
Um, like ketamine, which is now getting a lot of attention because it seems to be a fairly reliable and robust antidepressant, that is also the case with N2O. So some very high profile trials, including this one here through 2021, have found that nitrous oxide uh, reduces depression. And this is also, it's important to emphasize, this is in treatment resistant uh, depression. Okay. Um, and so this is kind of a demonstration of that. And there have been a multiple studies showing that now in nitrous oxide. And that's perhaps not that surprising given it's similar um, phenomenology and neurochemistry to um, ketamine, which is pretty widely regarded as an effective antidepressant. Um, I should probably say something about uh, safety. Nitrous oxide has a very, very poor reputation, uh, particularly in the UK where you'll often see it being referred to as hippie crack. Um, this is obviously in the recreational use of nitrous oxide. Uh, you don't hear that term when we talk about medicinal uses of nitrous oxide. Uh, the reason is that because it is lethal under extreme circumstances. So um, you will hear case reports of um, mostly young people, unfortunately, using excessive amounts of nitrous oxide and um, having breathing pro problems that, that could be lethal, so hypoxia. So that is real and that's observed. And for those of you who have not seen nitrous oxide, it's these little cylinders that you'll see kind of strewn about the streets of London whenever you come to London, basically. And I, yeah, I assume you probably have some of them here as well. Uh, it's been given some, a lot of attention recently because there's now uh, under consideration a ban on the use and sale of nitrous oxide because of its recreational use um, and the perceived harmful effects. Um, this is outside my expertise, but uh, a leading um, psychopharmacology expert, uh, David Nutt, uh, who previously worked for the government in terms of their drug safety panel, uh, has argued that nitrous oxide is notably less harmful than alcohol. Um, I'll let you kind of have a think about whether whether that's true or not, but um, that you know it, it does you know it is important to kind of acknowledge these types of points. Um, but one thing I should say is that the doses that we use of nitrous oxide in the lab are uh, radically lower than uh, what people are using in a recreational context. So the reason why we're interested in nitrous oxide um, is that as a dissociative anesthetic, it produces pronounced dissociative symptoms. So for those not familiar with the concept of dissociation, it is a um, very common transdiagnostic symptom. So it's something that's present across a wide range of different types of psychiatric disorders. So it's typically characterized by, by a disruption between normally integrated cognitive perceptual systems. So there might be some type of breakdown in the interaction between memory and identity or awareness and perception of these types of effects. This is from a meta-analysis of looking at dissociative symptoms across a wide range of different psychiatric disorders. And whenever you see in different disorders, it typically is associated with poor outcomes. So patients with depression who have excessive levels of dissociation tend to have poor outcomes, for example. The same goes for a wide range of other disorders. One of the reasons we're also very interested in the context of psychedelics, but also in other contexts, is that dissociation is now increasingly really recognized as a salient antecedent to hallucinations. So dissociation is a fairly reliable predictor of hallucinations in a wide range of contexts. Um, and this is a kind of a simple model of the link between trauma and hallucinations. And here you have dissociation in the middle um, this has been demonstrated in a couple of different meta-analyses. Um, one of them went so far uh, as to argue that hallucinations should be reframed not as psychotic symptoms, which is how most people think of them, but as dissociative symptoms. That's how strong the association is between dissociation and hallucinations. There is obviously some controversy about that idea, but that's how strong the association is, such that um, there's been a lot more attention to that idea. And so these are kind of some of the factors motivating um, our interest in nitrous oxide. Because with nitrous oxide, we can reliably induce dissociative states in the laboratory and start studying these phenomena in a much more controlled context. Another interesting element is that it allows us to kind of start targeting heterogeneity in different dissociative states. So dissociation, I'm using in a broad sense, but it's actually a very kind of fragmented construct. So you typically have episodes of derealization where an individual kind of have various types of perceptual distortions in terms of their environment or the world won't feel real or their environment. Um, they might feel detached from their environment. 
depersonalization where they might have a disruption in their sense of self, feel detached from their emotions, detached from their bodies, so on. And then in a more extreme context, you have identity distortions. So this would be examples like dissociative identity disorder, for example. Um, so just a kind of a simple example of this is that we have medical air, which is our placebo condition, nitrous oxide. This is state dissociation. So you receive fairly reliable, at the individual level, in increases in depersonalization, derealization. Basically, pretty much everyone has these uh, episodes on the influence of nitrous oxide. And you see similar effects in uh, ketamine. Now, one question then becomes the relevance to psychedelics. And some of you might be thinking, well, you know, is this really about psychedelics or not? So some of you might recognize that the most uh, commonly spe cited or specified response to psychedelics in more recent years has been ego dissolution. Right? You often hear about ego dissolution, some type of breakdown or disruption in the sense of self. That's a classic instance of depersonalization. Right? So for whatever reason, those researchers are actually coming from a psychoanalytic tradition. Um, it might not be clear you know, that, that that's how that emerged, but that's basically where they're coming from. They're using the term ego dissolution, but they're talking about what psychiatrists would normally refer to as depersonalization. So there's some very clear relevance here to the broader psychedelics literature. I want to highlight kind of one example of this. Um, this is uh, purely at the symptom level, so there's no cognitive tasks here. Um, at present, we do not have a robust cognitive or perceptual task to measure dissociation, and that's a kind of a challenge for this field. So this is a study we did in collaboration with our, um, a group at uh, UCL, where they, we had 160 participants. Uh, this was led by Piazza and uh, Sanjeev Kambaj, the collaborators. And so basically, um, this was in a classic uh, placebo-controlled design, where they basically looked at state dissociation scores in response to uh, nitrous oxide. And they also looked at um, uh, various types of psychotic symptoms, or we call psychotomimetic symptoms. So these are things like negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So this might be like disorganized cognition, for example. Social anhedonia, so various types of um, social uh, challenges that you often see in psychosis, depersonalization, and then positive symptoms like hallucinations. Now, what's interesting is um, what uh, Julia did basically was took all these different items of dissociation, psychoto, psychotic states, so psychotomimetic states, and basically put them all together to look at how they kind of clustered together. And what you find are these four different clusters. And what I want to really flag was that depersonalization was more closely clustered to positive symptoms than negative symptoms and social anhedonia were to positive symptoms. This very much aligns with this idea that I flagged a moment ago, that dissociative symptoms are strongly related to hallucinations, but even more so than other symptoms we classically put within psychosis, like negative symptoms. Okay, So basically, again, depersonalization is, seems to be closely coupled with hallucinations to a much greater extent than hallucinations are with other classic psychotic symptoms, like disorganized cognition, for example. And so this kind of provides like an experimental way to start kind of probing some of these questions that have really kind of only been studied within psychiatric samples to date. So the last slide, um, just as kind of a, uh, almost a, a bit of, a, to further motivate um, further work in N2O, so there's very little work going on with uh, N2O right now compared with other psychedelics. So I hopefully can convince you that we need a lot more. So first, at the 50% mixture that we use, which is 50% nitrous oxide, 50% oxygen, um, and nitrous oxide is completely safe. Um, we have never observed any kind of side effects, neither have our collaborators. Um, relatively minimal things like a bit of dizziness or nausea, things like that, um, but nothing profound. What's very striking and very exciting from an experimental standpoint is the rapid onset and offset of the response. Nitrous oxide from inhalation starts to have psychoactive effects within one to two minutes. Once you remove the inhalation, the effects disappear within one to two minutes. Now that might not sound that exciting for those of you who are not like kind of running experiments in the lab, but this is profoundly exciting when you compare and contrast this against other psychedelic drugs like LSD, ketamine, and so on, which, ha which have these kind of long, long effects 
in the order of hours sometimes. So you can't exactly just turn it on and off, but you can come pretty close to that, where you can actually remove the mask. And this allows you to do much more controlled experimental trials, where you can have people inhaling nitrous oxide, then move to a placebo, and then move back and forth, which is something you cannot do with classic psychedelics. And this allows you to kind of investigate cognitive and perceptual effects in a much more kind of clean laboratory context that is not afforded by classic psychedelics. This is less of a consideration, but it's one that's worth noting. Um, because nitrous oxide is legal, it's far, far uh, less expensive than these types of drugs. And so um, running nitrous oxide studies in the laboratory context is relatively easy um, in terms of ethics and other practical considerations. Um, so um, I just want to kind of flag that we kind of we have a number of kind of ongoing uh, research projects going on in different types of cognitive perceptual effects, as well as uh, neurophysiological characteristics of dissociative states produced through uh, nitrous oxide using EEG. Okay, so I think I'm not too bad. Um, I've got about 10 minutes left, and then um, if anyone has to leave, feel free to leave, of course, no worries. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of methodological challenges for this field. Um, I'm, a, I'm really thinking about instrumental research, but most of these challenges basically correspond and apply to those that are present in uh, neuroscience research on psychedelics or more therapeutically driven work. So one thing I think is not getting the attention that it deserves is phenomenological and clinical variability in response to psychedelics. So at the phenomenological level, um, you'll often hear a reference to a psychedelic state, for example, right? There is no psychedelic state whatsoever, right? Coming from conscious research, we know for a fact that we're talking about a plethora of different types of phenomenological patterns that somebody could experience in response to psychedelics. And that heterogeneity tends to kind of get washed out in the type of research you see on psychedelics, where they'll kind of hone in on a specific symptom, or they'll just talk about a score on some type of scale and how it correlates with neurophysiological measure, and they're really kind of ignoring that rich heterogeneity. Um, and so we really need to see a lot more of that. The clinical level, I'm sure many of you are interested in the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelics. This is um, actually from uh, one of my colleagues at King, so James Rucker's group recently published a meta-analysis of controlled trials on psychedelics for uh, depression. And there's the overall effect is relatively large, but one thing it's worth flagging is the effect sizes are very, very different across the different studies. So this is statistical, statistically a considerable level of, level of heterogeneity, and trying to understand that represents a really significant challenge for this field. Why this clinical trial here observed an effect that is eightfold higher and the effect observed in this study, for example. Those are radical differences from one trial to the next. Part of that's due to small sample sizes, uh, which is a kind of something that's plaguing this field for obvious reasons as it's in its infancy, but that's kind of a really significant challenge for the field. Another one that I think um, is not getting enough attention is psychometric challenges. So you've probably all heard of the phenomenon of absorption. So absorption is a psychological trait that was kind of introduced in the 1970s and is widely seen as the most reliable trait predictor of response to psychedelics. So people who have high scores on absorption tend to have more pronounced psychedelic responses. That's been kind of consistently documented, including this kind of large scale review from a few years ago. All right. Now, um, in response to a paper that came out of PNAS um, on absorption as a predictor of various types of anomalous experiences. My colleague who actually played, uh, or Graham Jameson, who kind of helped develop the most recent version of the scale. We were struck by the fact that if you look through what this questionnaire is measuring, we actually have no idea what it's measuring, all right? Um, so this scale, which people refer to as absorption, the tendency to get absorbed in your activities, which is something we all experience from time to time. You watch a film, you become so engaged, you lose awareness of what's going on around you. You go to a concert, you become so engaged in the music, and so on. So that construct conceptually makes sense. But if you actually look through the questionnaire, 
it has five different kind of elements that's capturing. So things like, I find that different colors, odors have different colors, so synesthesia. There's no obvious connection to absorption there. And so this is the most widely used scale to predict individual differences in response to psychedelics, but actually has what we would consider in psychology to have very, very poor construct validity. So this whole area of research in psychedelics is really compromised. We think there's a lot of problems going on there. And there needs to be a lot more attention to that. Another thing that I'm struck by is that different drugs that have very, very different uh, neurochemical targets and different neurophysiological mechanisms end up having very, very similar phenomenological and neurophysiological properties when you look at kind of responses. So the good example here is this really nice study uh, from last year. Uh, this is a collaboration from the Imperial Group and the Sussex Group where they compared LSD and placebo and ketamine and placebo. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically both of them increase a measure of what's called signal diversity. So it's basically this called this measure of lempel Z complexity. Um, and also information transfer, how much uh, information transfer there is going on in the brain. And basically you have reduced information transfer in both relative to placebo, and you have increased signal diversity in both. And this is kind of something you consistently see that LSD and ketamine actually have a lot of overlapping neurophysiological effects. And they also produce some similarities at the phenomenological level, although they diverge quite considerably, and both are obviously antidepressants. This kind of raises a kind of a really salient challenge though when we think about their antidepressant effects. What are the actual differences between these drugs that are producing these commonalities? Um, and it's also, I'm gonna kind of, if both of them are producing these kind of anomalous experiences, it might be the case that it's about the anomalous experiences they're producing rather than the underlying neurophysiological specificity. And I'm kind of hinting at something I'm gonna come back to in a little bit. So the elephant in the room in contemporary placebo, in contemporary psychedelics work is placebo effects, okay? So um, very few people are considering this possibility and taking it very seriously, but there's now starting to kind of accumulate uh, a lot of concerns. Uh, this is something that was posted uh, recently on Twitter, actually, where it says, so I'm guessing we're in the placebo group. Right. So these people here quickly realize they are in the placebo group while these other people are dancing around. So this gets at a really critical issue, which is at the core of kind of like uh, methodological design within experimental psychology and cognitive neuroscience, and that is blinding. So basically, what we've known since uh, the late 18th century, when Benjamin Franklin first investigated what was called mesmerism, so mesmerism, mesmer believed that you could pass a magnetic fluid from your hands and you could heal people, right? So Benjamin Franklin did the first double-blind studies and realized that, yes, it was producing effects in some people, but it only worked when they thought they were getting the effects. So it was an expectancy effect, okay? And there's no effect when people didn't know which condition they were in, all right? And the mesmerism didn't work. First example of the double-blind experiment in the modern era. So blinding is necessary to distinguish drug effects from placebo effects. Hopefully you can all appreciate that basically unblinding is nearly universal in psychedelics research. Pretty much every participant that takes part in a psychedelic study, at least those with psychoactive doses, are able to quickly figure out they are in the psychedelics condition. Okay? Now we know from other work that unblinding so participants realizing or experimenters realizing which condition someone is in or which drug they received or which manipulation they have undergone, that this inflates experimental effects by at least 25%. In the psychedelics context, it potentially might be even more than that. In a recent uh, opinion piece on this, um, Dupuy and Vessier argued that psychedelics might even constitute what we would call super placebos. All right, that they're building on the context and exacerbating these context effects and expectancies to produce all sorts of anomalous experiences and therapeutic outcomes. Now, this is a classic depiction of the placebo response. 
The placebo response is all about context. An internal context in terms of your emotions, your expectations, your memories of what happened the last time you received some type of intervention, and the external context of treatment cues, social cues, what we call verbal suggestions. The classic verbal suggestion that we've all had at least one time or another when you've gone to the GP is this is going to make you feel better. This medication is going to work, right? So verbal suggestions are at the core of all sorts of um, medicinal kind of applications and therapeutic applications in a wide range of contexts. Now we know, so verbal suggestions are communications for some type of involuntary response. So something that's gonna happen to you rather than something you're willfully or voluntarily producing. Now at the core of that is what's called direct verbal suggestibility. So participants vary in their responsiveness to these verbal suggestions. And this is something that's been known since the 19th century when people start studying suggestibility. And by suggestibility, we're talking about actual real changes in subjective experience. I'm not just, I'm not talking about people just saying, oh yeah, that worked for me or that didn't work for me. Because placebo effects really do change perception. So we know that suggestions can affect pronounced changes in perception. A nice example here, this is the use of a therapist using hypnotic suggestions for a patient undergoing surgery. And this is uh, kind of widely observed in a wide range of contexts that this can reduce the reliance on various types of medications. It's important to emphasize there's nothing special about hypnosis. It's nothing mystical or paranormal or anything like that. It's just the administration of verbal suggestions. That's all that's really going on in the context of hypnosis. Now, well, guess what? Psychedelics enhance suggestibility. This has been shown in multiple studies now with LSD, with uh, nitrous oxide, with other drugs. Some studies have found, including one that we did, that suggestibility uh, predicts placebo responding, that very highly suggestible people are more responsive to placebos. Other research has shown that they are more responsive to nocebos, so side effects in various contexts. The best trait predictor of suggestibility. So the best trait predictor of suggestibility, guess what it is? It is the Telgen absorption scale. The absorption scale, which also happens to be the best predictor of psychedelics, of response to psychedelics. So you'll see some, some clear parallels here. So you might think, okay, you know, psychedelics are pretty profound, really robust effects. We might not really expect suggestion, suggestibility to be able to produce these really profound effects, right? And that's this is really kind of an empirical question. Here's a fun little anecdote. It's from the 1990s in California, where three fourth graders unintentionally consumed LSD and had hallucinations, dizziness, and nausea. This was confirmed blood tests. They genuinely had LSD, and they had to go to the hospital. There were 11 children there who also consumed a powder um, at the school, had hallucinations, other symptoms, and so on that kind of closely paralleled what you saw in those, but they had no drugs in their system. And all 14 children had to go to the hospital, and they were, luckily everyone was fine, and that was it. And they were all uh, discharged later on. This provides a kind of an example of how the idea of taking psychedelics might be able to produce some of the psychedelic responses. So now, um, I've only got a few slides left. Um, one of the kind of very interesting studies that was published on this in the last few years, let me skip this in the interest of time, is can you produce psychedelic responses with a placebo? So this is a paper that was published, Tripping on Nothing, <laughs> right? Placebo, Psychedelics, and Contextual Factors, where they created a kind of a classic, I and mean, it's a bit of a stereotype, of course, but a classic psychedelic context with kind of, you know, psychedelic imagery, lighting, and so on and so forth. And they gave them a placebo, which was just uh, an inactive substance, and told them this is going to produce various types of psychedelic responses. Uh, it was presented as a type of psychedelic mushroom, the environmental context was crucial, and also crucial was they had confederates who behaved accordingly. So people who acted out the role, right? And this is something that also occurs a lot in alcohol, with alcohol use as well, that if your friends start acting a bit stupid, you're statistically going to be more likely to start doing stupid things as well, right? So the data here are a little bit complicated, but 
These lines here are individual participants for various types of anomalous experiences you typically observe with psychedelics. And one of the kind of the big points here was that some of the participants reported subjective changes in perception uh, in terms of different types of insights, changes in their perception, so on, that paralleled what you see in psilocybin studies. Okay. Well, it's important to emphasize these are subjective measures on a scale, and we don't obviously know what would happen if you put them into a scanner or record their EEG when you see similar effects. What was also striking was 12% said they were certain it was a psychedelic. Some of these individuals had previously used psychedelics. So even those who had previously used psychedelics, um, were, were, some of them were still believed that they had consumed a psychedelic. Uh, and this is a nice little paragraph. During the debriefing, when we revealed the placebo nature of the study, many participants appeared shocked. Several gasped and started laughing. One stated it's very funny. Another said it's very sad. One of the participants who sat, had sat with a group near the paintings throughout the study asked, sorry, I'm laughing. Uh, so we were all sober and just watching these paintings for 45 minutes. Yeah. Right. So they were just kind of sitting there having a psychedelic response to some paintings. But in reality, they are just been given a sugar pill. So, are there placebo response and psychedelic effects? Um, I'm going to take the kind of the simple answer by saying almost certainly yes. I feel 100% confident there are placebo responses in psychedelics. So hopefully, that's pretty clear cut to you now, having seen some of these effects. The critical issue is going to be the magnitude of these effects. That's the critical issue, right? Whether it's 75% of the psychedelic response, 20%, what that is, we do have no idea at this point. So the last few points that I want to flag, though, is that some people have argued, if so, if there are placebo effects in operation in psychedelic trials, so what? Maybe it doesn't really matter. This is a view that you'll often hear from, um, and I don't want to pigeonhole them too much, but from therapists, uh, people doing psychedelic therapy, for example. They'll often say, well, you know, it's about the context and the, set and the setting, and, you know, if, if those are the really important ingredients and these placebo effects are at play, it maybe doesn't really matter. And I actually understand that argument because at the end of the day, if you're a therapist, maybe it doesn't really matter what the mechanism is as long as you have positive therapeutic outcomes. Okay? But if you dig deeper into that kind of argument, it, it doesn't really hold up because you really need to do placebo research if you want to do mechanistic research. If you want to try to understand the mechanisms underlying response to psychedelics, you need to control for placebo effects. To separate out effects that are attributable to the intervention from those that are attributable to a placebo effect, from those that are attributable to just random effects. Some participants just get better in clinical trials. And so that for that reason, you need to have no treatment groups. You need to have placebo groups. And this is the reason why you do these types of studies. Okay? to separate out these different effects. This is necessary if you want to try to understand the neurocognitive mechanisms underlying psychedelics, but it's also necessary for enhancing therapeutic efficacy. Right? So if you want to actually try to improve uh, outcomes in psychedelic clinical trials, you have to decide which phenomenon are you targeting. Are you targeting the placebo effects? And that might be a worthwhile endeavor, of course. Are you targeting the genuine kind of uh, neurochemical effects that are specific to the drug. A lot, another point is that placebos are essential for understanding side effects. Okay? And side effects, I think, are not giving the attention that they warrant within the context of psychedelics, because a lot of people often hear about side effects being kind of downplayed. But it is true that participants will have, um, some participants will have genuine negative side effects. A really nice illustration of this, and this is one of the most shocking results I saw from of any research from 2022, was meta-analysis of COVID-19 vaccine trials, where they looked at, they compared the vaccines and the placebos in the original trials and looked at side effects, like little small things like fatigue, <coughs> headache, so on and so forth. I, for example, when I got the first COVID vaccine, I did have some minor side effects. I didn't really feel that great that afternoon. I remember like maybe I have a bit of a headache. That was widely reported in the media. I'm sure some of you probably have that as well. Um, but fairly minor stuff. 
So in the vaccine arm, 46% of people would report at least one or more of these side effects. But guess what? In the placebo, it was 35%. If you do the quick little calculation on these numbers, what that means is that nocebo effects accounted for 75% of the side effects from the COVID-19 vaccine trials. 75% of that, which is due to our expectations, beliefs, the context, the media, and so on and so forth, and had nothing to do with the actual vaccines themselves, right? That's pretty striking. So what that also means is that there's probably no SIBO effects in operation in the context of psychedelics as well. And a clear illustration of that is with those children um, in California, for example, where it produced things like nausea and other unwanted side effects. So what I want to flag is that basically context is widely recognized as an important ingredient of psychedelics. It is the principal driver of placebo responses. And I think that psychedelics research, either at the therapeutic level, the neuroscientific level, as well as the kind of experimental cognitive level, has really not come yet to terms with this. And this is going to be kind of just a really salient um, path forward for this uh, line of research. So these are the kind of the points I've kind of taken you through. Um, and I hope that we might have a bit of time for some questions. And I just want to briefly flag that we have a PhD studentship. If you want to come and study nitrous oxide with us on nitrous oxide and dissociative states, uh, that's coming up. So um, do feel free to pass that around if anyone is interested in joining our lab and studying some of these effects more. Um, so that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Great, thanks very much. Has anyone got any questions? I've still got a few. Do you want to pick people or should I? Um, so this is going back to the nitrous oxide and how you said it has similar mechanisms to ketamine. And I know for ketamine there have been um, things of how it can recover lost spines sort of after, say, chronic stress, promoting spine genesis and recovery. Is is there any research that's done that for nitrous oxide, or would it also be too short to get any lasting neural impacts? No, there's been, uh, there's almost no basic neuroscience research going on, uh, particularly that type of question. Um, okay. or, or if there is, I'm, I'm just not aware of it. There, there very well may be, but I, I can't comment on that. You know, mm -hmm. There's very, very little going on nitrous oxide. Um, Um, you mentioned uh, in terms of the rebus theory that psychedelics uh, reduce the power of priors, but you also mentioned that there are some examples where it increases the power of priors. Yeah, so I kind of, just for the sake of simplicity, I had to kind of um, provide a kind of a, a simple version of that. Um, so in their model, they actually are talking about what we would call high level priors. So an example of a high level prior might be your kind of your metaphysical beliefs about the world or something like that. So they cite examples of how um, right wing extremists who have taken psychedelics have kind of reduced their kind of authoritarian beliefs or things like that, for example. So that might be considered like a high level belief that's something that's kind of modifiable in theory, um, whereas they would argue, that, at least in their account, that low level basic perceptual priors in your environment, like low-level features of visual perception and so on, uh, that those might not actually be altered. Yeah. So, that, so, But I would argue that's, uh, that's again, that's it's probably a, an oversimplification even still. I think even with these kind of more high-level or moderate-level priors, you will see some effects. So, for example, we view suggestion and suggestibility effects. We view those as prior effects, right? That, I introduce a, a verbal suggestion that gives you a very precise prior that's mm -hmm. going to bias your perception. There's some evidence that psychedelics enhance how much we weight priors in our perception. And that's why we might enhance suggestibility with psychedelics. So that might be a kind of a counter instance for that type of simple account. But some people have criticized it and said it might just be a little bit kind of simplistic. I think they probably kind of walk that back a little bit to acknowledge that as well. Um, could you go back to the slide on the, um, it was towards the start on synesthesia, where it was comparing the rates of synesthesia in synesthetes versus drug users? 
Yeah, that one. Um, I noticed that 2CB and Amanita both had um, a sort of reversed effect where um, you saw... Um, yeah, could you talk about that a yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so I, I didn't go through this fairly quickly. Um, so the light colors are the synesthetes. So what this means is that the synesthetes for almost every single drug, they're more likely to have drug-induced synesthesia than healthy controls. So they have kind of just an inflated... Uh, propensity for having novel forms of synesthesia, as well as enhancing their synesthesia. The only two exceptions to this were Amanita and 2CB. Um, we don't have any kind of um, mechanistic explanation for why that might be the case, um, and that might just be noise. Yeah, okay. So I, I really can't say. We just we did highlight them in red, just to explicitly flag that because it might not be obvious from the figure. But for all the other 26 drugs, it was higher for synesthetes and controls. I, I, am I right in saying that TCB has a slightly different molecular mechanism of action where it's um, not a full agonist at 5-HT2A and it's more active at 2C? Yeah, so I, I, uh, my understanding of the neurochemistry of 2CB isn't super strong. I'm, not, I'm going to be completely transparent about that. Um, what I do know is that um, it's, it seems to be much more complex yeah, than, than some of the, the other phenethylamines. Um, that might be the case. I mean, I should also say that these, these clusters are also, some people might even contest those. Yeah. So we kind of came up with some conceptual clusters that, you know, similar mechanisms of action, um, but there are some disagreements. And you might speak to some other researchers who would use different clusters, for example. And we, would, we, we acknowledge that also in the paper as well. I wondered about the placebo problem and the inherent unblinding, if you had ideas about how to get past that. Yeah, um, so the unblinding problem is, is, is really, really tricky. Um, that was one of the reasons why we were interested in jumping on the microdose study mm -hmm. and contributing to that, because the blinding is less of an issue there. Um, yeah, so basically... Uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure of how you can do a classic placebo controlled trial of these effects in the sense of a placebo that is functioning as a placebo, right? Where participant, where a sizable portion of participants genuinely believe that they got the drug, right? Uh, so my initial take is that it's basically impossible. And that's kind of part of the controversy that's going on right now. So like the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, normally, they require rigorous placebo controls, and they kind of gave some exceptions to some of the psychedelic trials that have come out in the U United States that were approved. And some other researchers have come out and said, this is really quite striking that you allow these exceptions, but you don't allow them for other types of drugs. I think the best path forward is to compare it against, uh, compare different types of drugs with psychoactive properties. That, that would be where you're basically going to expect placebo effects in all of them, and you can at least start to kind of decompose the effects there. So in one of the big trials that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, they compared, um, I think it was psilocybin, um, against a classic uh, SSRI, like a classic antidepressant. Um, and one of the interesting results there was that they basically had very similar outcomes. So even though they were actually expecting the psychedelic to have a better effect, it actually looked very similar to uh, an S a classic SSRI, um, although the study was underpowered because it was one of the first studies and they had a relatively weak sample size. Um, so I think you know a really nice line of research would be to basically compare ketamine and different and LSD, for example, ketamine and psilocybin. Um, but you just have to kind of accept the fact that um, there's going to be expectancy effects, and I think that's another way of kind of targeting it. If the effect is kind of driven by expectancy. And statistically, you should be able to uh, determine that by actually measuring participants' expectancies. Um, yeah, so that would, that, would, that would be another kind of crucial way of, of targeting that by actually measuring expectancies. And if expectancies are a really robust predictor, then that's going to be a concern. Yeah. There's been a suggestion there's some non-hallucinogenic psychedelics and analog of ibogaine. That could, that would be very helpful to yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's where people are. That's another kind of route. Uh, basically, you get psychedelics that do not produce um, hallucinations and anomalous experiences. That's happening with um, 
uh, with uh, with cannabis, for example, for some of these treatments for like epilepsy. Um, so um, you can separate out um, the component processes, and you can kind of target that uh, target particular symptoms without um, eliciting the kind of uh, the THC effects, for example, right? Um, so that would be kind of one intriguing element. I think the critical issue would be there. Uh, a lot of the psychedelics researchers believe that the therapeutic outcome is directly tied to the psychedelic experience. Mm-hmm. And so that would be a kind of a really rigorous test of that, right? If you can kind of have something that's going on at a neurochemical level, which is very similar, but it's not producing hallucinations, what's going to happen there in terms of therapeutic efficacy? And so I think that would, that would actually be really cool yeah, and interesting. I think you had a, maybe I'll go, let you go first. Um, I think the idea of the, the idea of using NOS is really interesting in this kind of field, especially for a lot of the reasons you mentioned about kind of like legal benefits um, and cost and everything. And so the way that I've heard the NOS described as like its mechanism of action is kind of like an opioid and like spine on the spinal cord level, right? And I was wondering whether there are reports of synesthesia-like symptoms and whether that ties into any of the different mechanisms for synesthesia that you mentioned, and how you would cluster, how you would add nitrous oxide into the clustering, um, and if it is applicable into those different clusterings that you were showing on the graph. Um, for the, the clusterings for synesthesia? Yeah. Yeah, so it is there, actually. Oh, was that? Okay. Yeah, sorry. There's, there's 28 drugs, so it's reasonable to miss it. Um, yeah, so it's uh, uh, it's right here. All right. Yeah, so it is clustered with uh, DXM and ketamine, mm-hmm. so it aligns very nicely. So these are the these are the dissociatives. Um, um, uh, yeah, so so we did observe the significant uh, non-random clustering of those. Uh, you are correct, though. Uh, so the yeah, so it's uh, it's fun to read some of these uh, chapters on the kind of the neurochemistry of nitrous oxide, and because it is uh, incredibly complex. So it actually uh, targets GABA, dopamine. Um, there's been some really nice work, um, and obviously you know, NMDA receptors, uh, the glutamate. Um, but there's been some really nice work lately on separating out the dissociative effects from the um, from the analgesic, so pain reduction effects. Um, and you can do that with a benzodiazepine, so GABA agonist. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive because there's work showing that GABA agonists actually increase dissociative states. So it's a little bit kind of weird, but basically if you couple them with nitrous oxide and with ketamine, it also works with ketamine, what it does is it reduces the dissociative symptoms, but it doesn't seem to affect the analgesic effects of nitrous oxide and ketamine, which is quite cool, actually, right? Uh, so that's kind of preliminary work, it's, it's, um, but uh, they have replicated those effects, and they've kind of started to probe uh, the EEG, um, uh, EEG correlates of, of those changes. So you can kind of suppress the dissociative response, but the pain, uh, the analgesic effect is still there. So that's kind of a really interesting line of research. But um, it's a, uh, what's the term that uh, you often hear? Um, Psychopharmacology people saying that basically the targets it, it's a very promiscuous um, it's a very promiscuous drug basically right yeah I think you had a question yeah so yeah. it's the ping pong back and forth between this and the um, placebo so my question is about placebo effects and has there been much looking at sort of trial by trial if the effect decreases because specifically if we're trying to use like nitrous oxide and you're having you're taking advantage of how quickly it can end and you might have one case of it then sort of a, say, control case, and then that, and you're going back and forth. Would the placebo effect change? Because I can imagine there'd be a lot of, if it's because of um, expectation, and then like active influence, and that sort of thing, and then it might be decreasing as your body starts realizing, wait a sec, this isn't matching up. Yeah, so, I mean, one, we would def- I would say 100%, I would also acknowledge that there might be placebo effects of nitrous oxide, of course, as well. Um, we've been kind of probing that a little bit by using lower doses of nitrous oxide. So we recently did 25%, uh, which is kind of on this borderline. So some previous research showed with 25% that participants not are, all, um, are not able to statistically guess which condition they're in. Uh, we found that wasn't true, though. We found that they, they were able to guess uh, um, 
I think we had written about 20 people in the study, and I think like 18 of them guessed correctly. So, um, so uh, yeah, so I'm not very confident in the, those effects there. But um, yes, uh, it, when you're switching, it'll lead to differential kind of expectancy effects. If you were to go nitrous oxide, you're having some clear kind of responses, and then you go to another condition, you might expect that's going to be placebo, for example. Um, you could potentially have order effects. We've also... So again, what's cool about nitrous oxide is that we can do these kind of classic repeated measures designs that you only use in psychology, but you can't use with LSD and ketamine, right? Where we actually have done a 30 minutes of nitrous oxide, we then have like a 20 minute um, carryover period um, where we allow them to, to adjust, then we have a 30 minute placebo. You do have some carryover effects, so they are there, um, but they're pretty minor and pretty diminished. Uh, so you have those types of effects, and then which condition you had last certainly biases your perception of which condition is going to come next, 100%. Yeah. And so, yeah, another, another kind of challenge of doing that type of work. Yeah. Do you have a question? I'm really sorry to talk about synesthesia again. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, think I wasn't sure if you guys would be interested in synesthesia, so I'm very happy. Um, well, I guess I, I just find it really interesting that you can find these effects that are synesthesia-like in a completely normal population, particularly around the sound of visual space. Um, the most famous one that I know of is this idea that if you ask people to assign colors to musical notes, the brightness value does vary by pitch in the same way that it would with synesthetic um, participants. So I guess I was just wondering, how do the synesthetic experience in induced synesthesia map on to those with developmental synesthesia? Or does this um, kind of subsynthetic indication in normal population apply because there's a spectrum and then do synesthesia may fall? I guess what I'm saying is like, um, how similar are the experiences in induced synesthesia and developmental synesthesia for the person as well? Yeah, uh, so I, I, the question I think you're kind of hinting at um, is that is, is synesthesia actually more like a continuous variable? Right, so are, do do we all have some synesthetic experiences? Um, so, so that that becomes a little bit complicated, and some of us clearly do have these kind of implicit associations. The idea that A is red is very intuitive to me, and that B is blue, like super intuitive, right? Um, other ones are not right at all, but um, and and people vary in in terms of the intuitiveness of those. Um, but so you do have kind of some. And we also have cross-modal congruencies, you know, about like darker um, colors being associated with different types of pitches and things like that, that you will see in people without synesthesia, and those effects can be fairly robust. Some people have called that weak, weak synesthesia to distinguish it from kind of really pronounced developmental forms of synesthesia. But to answer your, your proper question, um, we haven't done enough really to probe how similar um, synesthesia is in these different groups with any kind of proper experimental studies. So we've only done just the case studies on this um, this case with um, acquired synesthesia because that was such a unique instance of that. And then we did the experimental study on LSD, but that didn't include anyone with synesthesia, right? So um, it doesn't, it seems to, one thing I will flag is this. So if you look at the inducers and concurrence, this is a biased sample from the literature because it's just a published literature. So we don't, like if you think about all the different clinical trials where they gave somebody ketamine, but they never bothered to ask them, right, had, did you have synesthesia, right? So we don't really know how representative this is at all. But again, one of the big take homes is that basically graphene color synesthesia, we literally saw one case out of um, you know, more than hundreds of reports of drug-induced synesthesia, uh, even though this is relatively common and I would expect, again, I would expect some graphene color synesthesia to be in the room, for example. Um, whereas sound, visual, this is also quite vague and not very specific, that sounds are just triggering various types of anomalous visual experiences. Synesthesia tends to be much more specific and precise. But again, that might be an artifact of that consolidation where you have the experiences for many years and they become consolidated and refined over time whereas these are really transient episodes, right? And so comparing and contrasting them becomes very complicated in that way. Yeah. 